thank you all for being here tonight and um, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome our speaker who has travelled down from the Brigade, which is where I met Leon. So, Leon, can you tell us a bit more about the organisation that you work with? Okay, so um, Brigade is a social enterprise and it's a joint enterprise between Beyond Food Foundation is the charity that does all the support work and works with people that experience homelessness. Baxter Story manages the management contract, so they take care of everyday needings. And PwC is their actual social enterprise, so PricewaterCoopers. And between the three, it is a fully functional operating restaurant that works with people that are at risk or experience homelessness. How did you get involved? Well, I got involved, uh, I used to work, I started off myself as an apprentice many years ago, 16 years ago now. I worked for a charity called Training for Life. I was one of those people that was in a box. I didn't finish school, I finished school when I was 14. I was sent to the Caribbean. Um, I was in care at the time, so I thought I was going on a holiday. When I got there, they said, actually, you're here because you're a bad boy. Otherwise, nothing would have happened to you. So I said, oh my Lord, what am I going to do? But I saw this as an opportunity. There was something strict me in my head that said to me, give it everything you've got and see where this goes. So I stayed over there for four years in an island called Dominica. Um, never knew anyone over there, but I got to know family. I went to school over there and they came you over there. Uh, so I didn't last there long. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was 14 when I went there, so um, yeah, I got over there. I did school for about six months, and one day the principal called me in the office, and he's like, oh, your uniform was wrong or something like that. You've got to get cane. This is the rules of the school. He called, I'll never forget, he called my mum up all the way to England and said, your son's in my office now. He won't get cane. So anyway, um, so it's very strict. School wasn't for me, I decided after then. It would have been if I got the chance, but I never had any GCSEs. A uh, lady, I started working on a construction site, at first, just carrying the materials in and out. And then a lady saw me one day and she offered me to come and start cooking with her. She had a little um, stool in the actual construction site. Her name was Joan Calls Latigue. She taught me how to cook from day one and I worked with her for the whole three years I was there in the end. Um, one thing I'll say about Dominica, it made me realize how lucky we are in this country. How many opportunities there are that we don't grab, like the schooling, the jobs, the, the healthcare, everything that you get, you know? And I just said to myself, give me another chance in life. When I get back, when I get back I'll give it everything. Amazing. And then what happened when you, how old were you when, you when you came back? I came back, I made sure I came back just before my 18th birthday, because I thought in my head, if I don't, I will have nothing. I'll have nothing anyway. But I came back a couple of, a week before I think it was. Um, I paid my fare to France. I didn't have enough money to get from France to here. I called my mum up, I said, look, I'm stuck, I don't know what to do. She sorted out the fear from France to here. I came back, nothing. So I didn't have a house, I didn't have money, I didn't have anything. So I went back to live with her at first. And I, I struggled, to be honest with you, I was lost. Didn't know what to do, didn't know how to work, didn't know anything, signed on. That was the first thing they tell you to do. And then I spent years in the benefit system. Until? Until? So when I was 24, uh, 21, sorry, I hanged around with people that got me into trouble and I ended up going inside. So I went into prison for hanging around with people that did something wrong. They called it joint enterprise at the time. And in there was one thing that showed me actually, you know what, never again in my life will I hang around with people that put me in a position that I don't want to be. And I remember I saw my mum that day and actually I went back to myself and I cried. I said to myself, Lord, give me one chance to do something in life and I'll give it everything. So I came out. Again, back to square dot, lost the little place I had, um, started again, got a house, and then started working my way up. A year later, um, there was an apprenticeship starting at a place called Hoxton Apprentice. The charity was training for life, so I was one of the first apprentices that opened that restaurant. Just before that, I like to rub this in because I never forget it as well. I went for Jamie Oliver's first ever Lads Academy, so I'll never forget that. Went to Westminster College, there was about at least a thousand people there. They filmed you 30 seconds, why do you want to be a chef? I'm sure I said the right things, but I never got the opportunity. I got a letter from Learning Skills Council that said, good luck with your future. I was so angry when I got that letter. I took that letter, I ripped it in half, and something told me, keep it. So I kept it in a plastic sleeve, torn up. I said, let me keep that. Anyway, Hox and Apprentice was born 2004. I can never forget it. One day before it was born, my daughter was born. 
13th of January, 2004, my first daughter. From that moment then, I 100% committed to myself, to anybody. I said to myself, give me that chance, I'll give it everything. I started that course. I said, okay, maybe the job centre send you on these courses. Maybe it's another course that's not going to amount to nothing. I'm one of those guys in the box, not, no qualifications, no education, no this, no that. Been in prison once in his life. There's not much opportunities out there. But I said, let me try, give it everything. Anyway, six months, I finished there. Um, I had four job offers at the end of it. I won the Outstanding Achievement Award. One was um, the Ritz, one was White's Gentlemen's Club, one was a contract caterer, and the other one was another contract caterer as well. I, I did the day in Ritz. John Williams was there, fantastic chef, but I saw the pressure in there, and I thought to myself, you know what, I can't commit to an environment like that for me to learn, to start with. So I went to White's Gentlemen's Club after that. I loved it. White's Gentlemen's Club, in case any of you don't know, one of the oldest Gentlemen's Club in London. Prince Charles had his stag do there, David Cameron, all different people like that are members. Um, it's a men's only club, I'm afraid. You have to get a black ball to be a member and stuff like that. But it taught me beautiful English cooking and discipline. Really good. So I did three years there. I worked six months on every section. I was cooking grouse. I was getting caviar flown in from Russian billionaires and all kind of ingredients I've never seen before. For me, that was the start. I've still got the book that I started there with, and now I've probably got about 20 books. So I did three years there. After that, I went to the Commonwealth Club, which was another uh, gentleman's club, but women are allowed in that club. I did six months there. Sorry, am I talking too much? No, no, it's great. Okay. <laughs> um, I did six months there, and basically, I'll never forget that club, because I used to come in, I used to say good morning to people. I felt like the outsider. Good morning. No one look at me in my eyes. I'm like, okay. Used to get things wrong. The sh the, they used to change the menu there every week. Remember, I'm someone that started as an apprentice, didn't know it all, still don't know it all. And it used to throw me completely. And the chef used to shout, he used to swear, he used to smash plates. I was like, you know what? Let me try. How long am I going to do this? I did it six months. I wrote a beautiful letter to the chairman and everybody else. Sorry, I can't work like this. Thank you for the opportunity. Left the um, Charion Cross that day, I remember walked to the station, in tears. I'm like, I've never walked out of a job in my life. I ain't had many jobs and I've just walked out of one. Called my boss where I started, the CEO, Gordon De Silva, and told him, look, I've left. He said, don't be silly, we'll have you back here. So I started back at the place where I started as an apprentice on a higher position, worked my way up to head chef in the end and started training the apprentices. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm just going to try and finish off this story about the past because now I've, I've learned one thing about the past. If you stay stuck in your past, you'll always be that person. My past is in the sea now. I left that in the sea. I learned how to throw that away. OK, but anyway, so I went back there as a CDP, went my way up to head chef. I was training. I was a head chef. I was doing the menus, doing things I've never done. Sadly, I knew the tra charity was going into administration. Um, so they were closing. The manager that was there at the time, he was going to work for a group of pubs. So they got six different pubs throughout London. And he took me on as their training and development chef. So I was doing the menus, training their staff. Pub land wasn't for me. It's not where I wanted to be. I like training and giving something back to people. So I said to myself, actually, I need something different. This is not what I want to do. So I did it anyway. And then um, I've got, always had a mentor, someone called David Mackay. He works for Sodexo. Again, a lovely man that's always just been there for me to guide me and protect me, talk to me about food or anything. And he pointed me in the direction of Beyond Food. He knew they were looking for a chef trainer. So he just mentioned my name. I went for an interview. I got the job back in 2013. So I have been there since 2013. And let's take it to the present now. So Beyond Food Foundation is an amazing charity set up by our chef founder, Simon Ball. He had a vision, that's all it was. He had a vision and he wanted to make a difference. So he went on Dragon's Den with that vision, saw the Dragons with his idea. He had a little business before then where he was working with people, ex-prisoners, ex-offenders, ex mental health problems, you name it. Just giving people that chance. It doesn't matter what they are or what they've been, give them that chance. So he brought these ideas to the Dragons. Sadly, they didn't fund it. But uh, through the Sparkbox Challenge, somebody funded him and he got money to take. So he went to PwC with cash in his pocket and said, look, I've got this idea, let's make it happen. The rest is history. Um, <laughs> another round of applause. <laughs>
Um, you mentioned Sparkbox. Yes. What is that? So that is some form of challenge. I don't know everything about it, but um, they look out, it's probably worth looking at, but they look out for entrepreneurs or somebody that has got a vision and they invest in them and they invested in his idea. And do you know why they didn't, why Dragon's Den didn't invest? Because people think a lot of, well, not the stigma around social enterprises, um, unless it makes money, it needs to make money no matter what. It can't just be a social, it's got to have a purpose as well. So it's got to have a strong purpose. It needs to make money as a, as a profitable business. And for the Dragons, they couldn't see that side of it. They couldn't see it making money. So uh, my boss, you can still see the video on YouTube. He went on there and made bread with a guy that was from prison, but they didn't see how that would be something that they're going to invest in. Mm -hmm. But Spark did and it, and it all happened. And what do you think Sparkbox saw? They saw potential. Center. The potential that Brigade is today. So Brigade is a social enterprise. You walk in there, it's amazing. You wouldn't even think that you can't tell who's the apprentices, who's the chefs. But it's somewhere that is giving people that opportunity that don't have it. To date, we've worked with over a thousand people for our courses. Um, so we've got a course called Fresh Life. And in Fresh Life, we just use food as a catalyst to inspire them. They might not want to be chefs. They could be whatever they want to be. But we will just use food as that catalyst to take them to that vision. Then they apply for the second part, which is called Get Stuck In, and that's more employability. And then, yeah, they do a bit around the kitchen, CV skills, interview skills, everything they need to be job ready. When they get to the end of that process, they can apply for either the apprenticeship, which is a two-year fully certified apprenticeship, one year with a brigade, and we will find them a job after that. They start with us with apprentice wage. Me, me, reason being, a lot of them are in hostels or chaotic, chaotic situations where they still need that help with their housing benefits and stuff like that. If you take everything straight away, they lose everything. A lot of them have not worked for some, we've had some people that have not worked for 20 years or so, you know. A lot of our people are a, lot, a bit older as well, so it's not just the 18 to 24s, it's any age group that wants inspiring or wants to move their life forward. And what is the um, criteria for someone to come and, you know, take on one of the, to become an apprenticeship? It's just at risk of homelessness. So that could be people that are sofa serving, that could be people out of prison, that could be people from that dealing with mental health problems, that could be people from the job centre, they're long term unemployed, that could be people that are whatever they lost, they think they had, got made redundant, started again. It's quite a wide spectrum, but it gives people that opportunity to date. We've worked with over 1,200 people for our Fresh Life and Get Stuck In programme. We've employed over 130 apprentices in our restaurant. We've been open seven, eight years. Eight years, I think it is now. I've been there seven, one year before. <laughs> Do the maths. And the 130 that would come and work with um, in the restaurant, yeah. um, you mentioned when we met um, that there's the other options for uh, the people that don't go down that path. Yeah. Um, is that something that the the people that sort of take on uh, that you take on is it do you think is it their choice that they're like oh, actually it's, we don't want to yeah. work for that for the restaurant we want to yeah. do something else what other routes would they go down so in that six weeks they kind of ident they get a little taste of everything so they get a little taste of front of house they get a little taste of the kitchen they get a little bit of employability skills and all of that and then they actually think is this something i want so some people naturally don't want to be in the kitchen they don't want to be part of hospitality they may want to be gardeners they may want to be florists they may want to be you name it bricklayers that any kind of industry it doesn't matter but we could have sparked that that energy to get up and just say you know what i can be employable now it doesn't matter what happened to me or who i am or what problems i got going up here i can like I, seriously at the moment so you're, you're providing help with changing mindset changing mindset so we've got support a lot of support they get so they got me from the chef side got a support and progressions manager. We do a f little bit about creative thinking. So we, my chef founder, Simon, he does a real good exercise with them. They draw where they think they are now and where they want to be. If I show you those pictures of those 100 people, you'd cry at quite a lot of them. So the, the beginning pictures are really red and horrible and dark and ghostly and no vision. Where at the end, a lot of people know what they want, but how they get there, they need them skills. And it just takes a few more organisations with social purpose to make that happen. Because I think the social purpose is a big part of it. There's no point, like, I get up in the morning and I'm so happy about the job I'm going. I can't wait to go and do it. I know, like, I feel so rewarded. I could go and work as a chef anywhere, really, if I want to. But I'm in somewhere that is, made, it's, for me, it's a purposeful job, you know? And it's changing people's lives. So what, would, what advice would you give to 
any, any business who would like to have more meaning in, their, in the work that they do and to, to have more purpose, what would you advise them to do? I'd advise that there's people out there that there's so many people unemployed at the moment. There's people that just need that chance. They need that in. There needs to be an in way into industry. So every kind of industry, there needs to be some kind of process that people can get a taster for it, first of all. I wouldn't try a different industry at all. I know where my purpose is. Whereas some people, they need to, they need to get a taster to do that. So I encourage businesses that have not got a social purpose to find that purpose and to let it out there. Okay, networking is the best thing you can do as well. So like us, we've got we've got the power of Baxter Story. Baxter Story is one of the biggest contract caterers ever. They've got Tottenham Football Ground. They've got all the banks. They've got restaurants like Monica Galletti, you name it. Um, John Campbell in the Woodspin. There's so many opportunities out there. We've linked up with them, so they manage us. Beyond Food, the charity, we've got thousands of support workers, thousands of, we've been into the prisons, we've cooked with them, we've done so many different things. It's all about those partnerships. PwC, powerful again, another organisation that supports us in any way. They do mentoring sometimes for us, anything where they'll come and talk about conflicts in the workplace. Barclays, we've got someone here from Barclays, we did a course with Barclays a week ago where they taught them the basics of money management. What does... Uh, how to write a check, how to set up an account, credit scoring, putting yourself on the actual electric roll. I didn't know that for years. People never, some people, look, I didn't grow up at home. So from 14, I was on the streets, I was homeless, blah, 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 blah. But nobody ever sat down with me and told me what I need to do in life to get where I need to be. I just met a young lady here today and then we're talking about housing. It's been something on my mind so much, but I ain't been able to do that because I've never had that guidance along me. I live in a place I should be able to buy it, but I don't understand how it all works. So I need that next step. So I encourage businesses that have these professions, let it out there, get, on a, get an apprentice. It's not that easy, but there is ways of you making that possible. And with Beyond Food Foundation, how have they, what do you think has been instrumental to their success in terms of being, being able to do what they do and be profitable in as much as a social enterprise? I think the vision is really important. It's a very clear vision. We know exactly what we're working with. We know what we want and we know what our goals are. We have a program that works. It 100% works. It's not for everyone. Some people fall off. They can come back if it doesn't happen. But I think it's about being close and it's a business, more importantly. So sometimes you'll, you'll see some social enterprises. I'm not going to say any in particular, but they're not run as a business. They've got all the social part with it right, but they haven't got the business part right. So has a business plan been done, first of all? Some people run into business without even doing a business plan these days. How, can you, how is your business ever going to make money? Or how are you, not just money, but how are you going to know the stages of what, your, what is your target audience? What do you want? What is your purpose? Why, do, why are you doing this? You know? And it's just about having those clear foundations. And where we work as well, the building's fantastic. So we've got School for Social Entrepreneurs upstairs. We've got SE UK, the awarding body for all social enterprises. We've got a private healthcare, Blossoms Healthcare, that is another social enterprise. And downstairs is the Restaurant Brigade. You'll walk in there and it's so professional. And you wouldn't notice the difference, you know? But it, people love the fact. You will notice the difference because you'll see the signs everywhere. Good food, doing good. We train people that have experienced homelessness. Pictures on the wall. We don't need to... Sh hide what we're doing, we want to shout about it, get the word out there, get more people as job centres and people that are crying that they, you know, they can't find jobs. There's thousands of jobs out there. I don't see why anyone should be un unemployed, no matter what they've been in. Brilliant. Um, sorry, anything else? <laughs> um, there, there, there's so, so there's many things. What, in terms of the like, business model, how, yeah. does it, how does that work? What is the actual business model? So the business model, they've been very clever about it. So. The business model, it could be replicated. It could have been replicated years ago, but they've quote, focused exactly on what we're doing there and getting that right before we reach out, yeah? So at the moment, it's at the stage where, to be honest with you, eventually in the next couple of years, yes, they could do another brigade somewhere and it will be profitable. Brigade is making money now. It's a profitable restaurant, lunch, dinner, breakfast. It's making money. It's there for a reason and the social purpose. Funding's another issue. There's people there to do those jobs, so we've got a fundraiser to get funding. But we don't. Ju we do funding like the old-fashioned way. So we like we have supper clubs and stuff like that. You know, we get people. That we'll, like, we'll do private dinners. We'll do all kind of stuff that will raise funds for the charity. But we are tapping into some funds that we 
and foundations that are willing to support the good work that we do because there is people out there like the fishmongers company for example they do help us a little bit as well uh, yeah, I think that's really interesting. You said about the old-fashioned way. It's kind of like, the, like in my mind, that social enterprise is like finding, rather than funding from, say, charity yeah. partners, it's kind of looking at ways you can actually deliver value exactly. and get paid for it. Yeah. Um, where, what, when it started, how, how, did it, how did it get started in the first place? So it was Simon with the idea. He approached, he had a friend in PwC. He approached him with the idea, and it all came together. It was a building site. The brigade was derelict. It was never going to be a restaurant. They didn't know what they were going to do with it. It was PwC's asset, and they made it happen. That's amazing, isn't it? Just shows the value. And they support life. us each yeah. year. Yeah. It's it's about I swear partnerships are very important, and I say it's the great not just about but the value of knowing what you want to do. So Simon's had this vision. He went to the tsunami. And that's, he volunteered in a relief camp out there and he saw so many homeless people and obviously that's a different kind of kettle of fish. Then he came back here and he was in the House of St Barnabas. So if any of you know the House of St Barnabas, he ran his business through there. So he was doing events through, with people that experience homelessness um, and training them. It's a short course, it weren't like what we were doing there. He had his own business then called Beyond Boyer. And he, his inspiration was that people don't just... People don't just become a homeless, they stay homeless unless there's something for them out. So you walk past people every day on the street. I walk past them and sometimes your mind, the first thing your mind says to you, shall I, shall I not? Are they homeless? Are they not? Should I buy them a coffee? Should I just walk past? Should I, are they just crying for the fun of it? Have they got a sign? Are they, you know, who knows? But there's other ways you can help them, you know, like creating these kind of opportunities for them. So the ones that want it, want it and yeah and the ones that are at risk that still want it uh, that want it and it works it really does work so i've finished training my old group now and that was uh nine apprentices and we've got seven new ones that have started in the kitchen this week so i will go out and visit them all in their workplaces like the proud trainer that i am <laughs> and seriously if it wasn't for simon this vision wouldn't be here there's a there's a few different projects they do different things in different time periods and different things but beyond food is a special charity where we really have we care about the people we work with and sometimes it's that empathy and i never even knew what empathy meant seriously i've been on a course lately that's empowering me as a leader i'm doing a leadership and development course through backs of stories a two-year course i graduate this year um, and it's, I've, I've empowered myself and people have empowered me, invested in me. Simon's invested in me so much. He's a mentor. He's a friend if I need him. He's a boss. He's everything I need him to be. And it's good to have people like, like that, you know, and the network we have, the people that know about us, it is powerful. And you've probably mentioned this already, but what is his, what is his vision to sum up? His actual vision. His vision is to help to help with this ho the homeless crisis and to create opportunities for people that to be there and to create an opportunity for people that would never have that opportunity if it wasn't there. And that's the whole purpose. Brigade is there because if you Brigade is so life changing. If you see the people we work with, there's a video I can show. You. There's videos on YouTube. You listen to some of those videos. So I'll give you one story that I'll share with you. For one past apprentice, he was in the army in Afghanistan medic he got bitten by a tick yeah um they put him in a hospital he, you know they, they retired him for duty he's brought him back here they put him in the the morsley or i think it was a mad hospital over there sectioned him completely he had to rebuild his life he came out from the morsley i think it was called and started our apprenticeship straight away he is such a strong character never cracked along the way if he did he's got that support there for him he worked in um, a private members club in Mayfair. He opened a new one there. What's it called again? I'll tell you after when it comes back to me. He just secured a new job at a brand new, the Saatchi Gallery. Um, Baxter Stories just took that over. They told, he went in there for a trial straight away. They wanted him. He's someone that is so employable and, you know, would have never thought of being a chef in his life, but he got that opportunity. Another guy, Mike, he's 60, I believe now. He's not retirement age yet. He was a prisoner aboard. He came through an organisation called Prisoners Aboard. Came to England. Don't know what he'd done. Not my problem. But he started as a chef. Now he's working in the country pub up in wherever it is. Not far from here as well. Cooking amazing meal. He does his own nights. He loves it. You know? If it weren't for that opportunity, where would, it, where would people be? Leo, what's your, what's your vision of where you want to be and what you want to do? Because you two say <laughs> we're just thinking, where's it all going to go? 
I want to give back. So I want a social enterprise as well. I want to be part of my own social enterprise. So I want to set something up that empowers people and gives them the opportunity to be employed. Exactly like what I've, the opportunities I've had. Brilliant. So um, what advice would you give to someone who, going back to where you were at the beginning of your journey, knowing what you know now? Never give up. <laughs> Never give up. And now, as some people will try and dampen your vision. So in school, they told me, I'm mad. I need an educational psychologist. I had people that told me I'll never be nothing. I never had no, I could have been one of those people. I never had no faith, but I always kept faith. I said, give me a chance to do something good and do it. Always have faith in yourself. You don't know what you want to do. When you're young, you never know what you want to do. But invest in yourself. You need to find that investment back in yourself. For me, my purpose, I, I didn't really have much purpose in life until I were, my daughter was born. That was when I found purpose in life. And I made that mental commitment in my heart, in my head, and said, this is everything. I've got a chance now. She's 16, so the same age as my career. She's 16 and I've got another one, she's 10. And they're my inspiration, I swear. I get up, everything I do in life is for them. And myself now as well, because obviously I, I feel like I'm important, I need to keep it going. Uh, it's because of a wonderful organisation like Beyond Food, you know? And I just say, can we ask? Yeah, yeah go for it, let's, let's so get the questions going. The people that come in at the very beginning, yeah. Do they have to start with some level of motivation? Not at all. Not at all. I had how, one guy shame. So they are key workers, and people will say. So a lot of people will come along. They might not know what they want to do, but they. Act, we had a guy Shane. He's got so many uh, mental health problems. Uh, so many different names. I never heard of some of them. Yeah. But one thing I saw in this guy, he can. He needs encouragement. So that whole six week process, I encouraged him. Simon encouraged him, Jan encouraged him. He's getting encouragement everywhere. He's on our apprenticeship now. He's doing in front of us. He don't believe he can do it, but he's got that chance. And sometimes it's just about opening that door for people. You know, if you don't open that door, where are they gonna be? They're gonna live their whole life in these organizations, going to meetings and never getting anywhere. Round and round in circles, probation, this one, that one, that one. And no one is actually doing anything to move your life forward. When you've got organisations like us that grab it, grassroots, you've got that support, you've got that energy, you've got things that can take you forward.